yourself in the community the way that you carry yourself in your family the way you carry yourself at work and what we're trying to do this this month is to shape our thinking and our alignment we've gone through an entire process of unveiling purpose over the last six months i can't believe it's been six months but now in this month we're dealing with representation okay and i'll read it very quickly for you guys and i'll read it from the message translation uh, because this looks very squint here so some people will be struggling to read but the bible says even though i am free from the demands and expectations of everyone i'm reading from the message translation i have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of religious non-religious meticulous moralists loose living immoralists the defeated the demoralized dash whoever tell your neighbor whoever Ah, this is what church is about. Church is for whoever. Okay? And our mindset needs to shift because there are times even when we invite people to church, we invite people we think can fit in. Are we together? But the Bible says that Jesus said he did not come for the healthy. He came for the sick. So the more they fit out, the more they fit into church. Somebody say amen. So he says whoever, whoever. I didn't take, now watch this. He says, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. Are we together? Then he goes and says, I have become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. Look at this last part. I did all this because of the message. Tell your neighbor, because of the message. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on. Let's continue. Is that the end? In on it. There was an it. My, you killed my energy. Okay. Simply says, I wanted to be in on it may the lord bless the reading of his word amen before you sit down i want you to have five two or three people and just tell them what's your reason what's your reason what's your reason what's your reason and you can be seated in the presence of the most High. what's your reason what's your reason i don't know who's on that time or trying to rush me out after you amen what's your reason what's your reason i want to welcome everybody this evening or this morning rather to church uh, it's a blessing to have you this, this wonderful morning, and we're continuing in our series on represent. Um, and it's important that we all begin to represent not just the gospel, and, but to represent God in our communities. Are we together? I've said this from time to time, that if God was completely or just solely concerned with your salvation, as we have perceived it, then the minute you got born again, he would preserve you and rapture you up. But the minute, because he has kept you on this earth, it means that he has a purpose for you on this earth. Okay? And I think that the church must begin to shift its mindset and stop being defensive and worried about where we stand with God and begin to worry about where the world stands with God. Because I've said this over and over, the, the, the responsibility for humanity has been placed on the church. God will hold the church accountable for what it has done with the world. But the gospel that we have preached is a gospel of salvation, Niweka. Now, while that sounds uh, 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 theoretically or theologically correct, I want you to say, to realize that it also puts a, a, a lack of responsibility on you. But I want you to realize that because God has given you the message, he has also given you the mandate to carry out the message. Okay? So, so salvation is not just looking out for yourself and trying to get to heaven. Salvation is taking as many people as we can with us. That's why the Bible says God is patient because he does not want any to perish. Somebody say amen. Amen. And it's important that as the church, we move from the selfishness that we have. I have said this again and again, and we've been saying this over this time, that every church member or every Christian has a ministry and has a mission. Okay? Every Christian has a ministry that's a gift that they use to edify, impact, or enhance, enlighten the church, but they also have a mission. 
something that is unique to them in the environment they are set, in the community they have been planted, in the job they have been positioned. God did not give you that job just for showing off. He gave you that job for a mission. God did not give you that family just for the sake of carrying a same name. Every God-given family has an assignment. God says through Abraham, he says through your family, all the nations shall be blessed. So while I agree that family is important, the reason family is important is not because they are your relatives, but it is because that is the primary vehicle through which God had positioned the church. The church began through a family before it entered the building. That is the primary importance for the, to the family, that is the primary importance for what we do. Because the family was the vehicle for the advancement of the kingdom. That is why being a good father matters. Because if you're not a good father, your children may not serve God the way they ought to. That is why being a good husband matters. Because your wife may not serve God the way she ought to. Are we together? Tell your neighbor, what's your reason? Your reason in life is important. God is concerned with our reasons. In fact, he says you have not because you ask amiss. Even when you ask, your motives are wrong. And as a church, from time to time, we must reassess, regauge, recalibrate our motives. Sometimes I'm convinced that churches are more concerned with an agenda than people. But how is that possible when God's primary agenda is people? So there's no way God's agenda can be achieved outside of people. Look at your neighbor and tell them people matter. You didn't sound convincing. Look at them one more time and tell them people matter. Okay? Now look at them once again and tell them you matter. Uh, uh, just in case. Now, now one of the gifts that God has given us is freedom. What makes human beings unique is freedom. Every one of you has what you call free will. Okay? Free will is a divine gift. You can choose this morning to wear whatever you want to wear. You can choose to go to whichever church you want to go. You can choose to watch whatever. Because one of the gifts that we have is freedom. Free will. And the primary reason God gave us free will is because God wanted us to show love or to show his love to us such that we would not just be compelled, but we would desire to love him. So free will was not given for selfishness. Free will was actually given for selflessness. Free will was given so that you can voluntarily say, I opt to lay my life down for Christ. So that you can voluntarily say, I have not been coerced. I have chosen to love God. Because our choices matter. We, we, we see in this scripture that Paul is talking about, that there are all kinds of people who have chosen the life that they ought to live. Immoral, moral, religious, non-religious, bigots, all kinds of people because listen let me tell you something life is defined by your choices you have your own choice and the life that you and I live is a result of the choice that we make but let me say this freedom does not mean selfishness it actually means selflessness you, you see there's a concept in this world today that the freer you are the less nobody has to tell you what to do but what many don't realize is the more you are rebellious, the more you are isolated, the more you choose not to define or narrow your life, the more you will be bound later in life by your decisions. Some people cannot spend money the way they want to because of debt. And it was a choice that seemed good at the time. But later on, your choice bound you. So the illusion in life is that the freer you are, 
the more nobody should tell you what to do. But Jesus said this. He said, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Because the way to eternal life, life in abundance, is narrow and well defined. So it's free, but not free. It's free, but not free. Because you cannot make any decisions that you want and expect to experience the fullness of God. I'm preaching this place. So, so God has given us liberty, not for selfishness, but so that we can voluntarily lay our lives down. And this is what we must say today. There's a beautiful song by William McDowell where he says, you know, take my heart, take my life as a living sacrifice. The Bible says in many ways that we ought to crucify the flesh daily. Daily we ought to lay our lives down because we ought to be dead to the world but alive to God. But here's the problem. Many of us are still very much alive to the world. Oh, very much. And the one fighting you is not the devil. It's you. Are we together? Be be because we have to come to a conclusion today that your life belongs to God. We need to settle this completely. Until you give your life as a living sacrifice. We're not even going any further here. That is the principal thing that we must conclude today. That God wants your heart not to abuse you, but to use you. Because whoever else has your heart will abuse you. When God has your heart, he'll build you. You see, so if your heart belongs to anybody else but God, you are killing yourself without even knowing it. If your heart is not devoted to God, you are entering the wide gate, but the end of that gate is destruction. So God this morning wants us to give our hearts to him. Because freedom means selflessness, not selfishness. Society places expectations of us. Because whilst we feel that we are free to make choices, let me tell you this. The choices you make are not your choices. This is a fact. They are not your choices. I was talking to my wife today on the, on, on the way. How many of us have seen that thing in the newspaper that's been going around the world about Zesco? I'm not here to talk about politics. Do you think all of a sudden people just care about Zesco? No, because media houses have an agenda. There could be some truth behind it. But why all of a sudden? It's because the issue is China, not Zesco. I'm getting into politics. So what I'm trying to teach you is this, is that there's an agenda in the world. And even your choices are not your choices. I saw a joke the other day. Who saw it on social media where they said every Zambian guy has this outfit? Who saw it? That picture of the red striped shirt. And I think every guy must have been like, yo, I actually have that outfit. Do you know why? Because the media houses have given us that picture. Come on, man. That to look professional, this is the way you ought to look. I, I was amazed when I went to Nigeria that people wore those akbadas. You know those things, the ones where they... And in their culture, that is a suit. People go to work in those suits. Because whoever controls the system dictates the expectations of your life. And let me tell you something. Society places expectations and puts pressure on us to conform. That's why Romans 12 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Because every day there is pressure for you and I to conform. Conform to sexual immorality. 
Conform to alcoholism. Conform to bigotry. Conform. Listen, I'm not criticizing anybody here. I understand because there is pressure. There is Ecclesiastes 10. Go to Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 18. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 18. Put it there. Put it on the screen. I want people to see this because, yes. Please change the background so people can see. Okay? It says, by much slothfulness, what happens? The building decays. So, just because your hands are not on it, it doesn't mean there's no force acting on it. So, so the only way to preserve the building is to maintain it. If you leave it, forces will act on it. It says, decays, and through idleness of hands, the house does what? Drops. So, so this is why we must be cautious even of our way of life. Because you cannot leave your Christian walk to osmosis. You cannot leave your spiritual life to osmosis. You, you cannot say, pastor, pray for me. I agree, there are times I ought to pray for you, but your prayer life cannot be defined by my prayers. That your spirituality, listen to me, if the only word you get on Sunday, I mean in your life is on Sunday, you are setting yourself up for disaster. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So we don't just eat the word of God on Sunday. It's our daily manna. So we've got to come back because society places expectations and pressure on us to conform, to become and to conform. Slowly, the lines are being broken. Slowly. 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 Lines of morality are being broken. I know that God is a God of grace. But let me tell you this, that when God made the heavens and the earth, he did it by grace. But what he left man with, listen to me, I've said this. God did not leave man with the miraculous. He left man with principles. It, it was in the garden that God said to Adam and Eve, you can have everything except this. So Adam was free, but not free. Because in life, you always have choices. Tell your neighbor you have a choice. I don't care where you are, you have a choice. You have a choice. You have a choice in that money situation. You, if you don't like your job, you have a choice. Quit. Uh-uh, let's be real now. Because some of us are tired of you. No, my job, eh, I hate it. Quit. There are other people who need it. Can you stop? Go. We are wasting our time. Because the minute you leave, the applications will be full of full. So why don't you give that space to somebody who can appreciate it? I'm preaching whether you like it or not. Because as Christians, we've got to learn to appreciate and value the things that God has given us. Somebody say amen. amen. So society places expectations. Huh? Because freedom, listen to me. Paul says this, he knows the expectations because he says, I, I, I am not a slave to anybody because society will place expectations. I, I thank God that the grace of God has delivered you from the expectations of men. So, so you need to be comfortable with yourself. If you don't have the right suit, hey, you're not more born again in a suit. You understand what I'm saying? Hey, you don't come looking the part without being the part. Because too many people want to look the part without being the part. We're tired of people masquerading in the office place. We're tired of people who look good in interviews and when they enter, yeah, they told us they love God in their CV. They told us they, their hobbies are church or, or, or their extracurricular activities are a choir member. When we get to the office, you're as good as a devil with your work ethic. You won't like me today. You say, wow. <laughs> so,
So God has freed us from the expectations of men. But our standard is never men. Our standard is God. And freedom always calls you to a higher level. That's why Jesus said, he says, Moses said that if, 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 you, if you commit adultery with a woman, then, the, oh sorry, you've committed adultery. But Jesus says this, he says, even if you just saw, look at a woman. So Jesus shows that even grace has a higher standard. Can you imagine what the law prescribed with action, grace prescribed with thought because everything starts in your mind as believers we have to start thinking differently although God has freed us from the expectations of men let me tell you something you and I are not free from the expectations of God because we'll be judged according to the law according to the word according to the standards and the expectations set in the word of God so being free from men, Paul says it this way. He says, although I am free from the expectations of men, I feel a compelling duty to give myself for you. Because I've come to realize that when faith is genuine, when your faith becomes genuine, you feel a mandate to help others. When your faith is genuine, you realize that you cannot live for yourself. That, that is why when your conviction is solid, it requires sacrifice. When we look at our freedom fighters, look at the irony. They had to fight for freedom. The irony is that freedom should not be fought for. It's almost oxymoronic. Fight freedom. Or fight for peace. But I've come to realize anything great requires sacrifice. Anything great requires sacrifice. And God has placed a great mandate on your life. And he's expecting you to not drive or to go down the wide way, but to live your life down the narrow path, which leads to eternal life. Tell your neighbor, say amen. amen. Look at them one more time and say, I hope you're listening. Because freedom, true freedom, is not self-gratification. True freedom is self-denial. Whatever you cannot say no to, you are actually not free. You are bound by. You know, one of my biggest challenges is, is um, sugar. Sweet stuff. I love sweet stuff. Don't look at me like that. I love sweet stuff. I love certain foods. I love lamb. I love lamb. Lamb is amazing. I love lamb. My wife knows I love lamb. I understand why Jesus is the lamb of God. It's delicious. And growing up, I always wanted to reach a stage where, where nobody could tell me what to eat. I'll eat what I want. And, and you see, especially in Africa, we, we judge freedom by your ability to break rules. You can't park here. My parking up. Wow. <laughs> Chirishan. It, we, we, we bench progress by who we know and the rules that can be broken. That is why they con that our countries are in chaos. Because the minute you reach a higher level, what you're thinking of is not maintaining the rules, is breaking the rules. Then you are the same ones telling us to not break the rules, the rules you are breaking. Are we together? Because true freedom is self-denial. And, and I realize that, is that the older I got, eating certain foods, even though people tell me, it's not good for you. Well, what? I'll eat what I want. But eventually, it affects your body. And eventually, you realize that what you cannot say no to, you are bound by. It's not freedom. You see, the enemy has masked bondage under the disguise of freedom. People are bound. And people are afraid to come out and say, 
I have issues. I got challenges. And the church needs to be a place where people can come out and say, I have an issue. I have this issue. I have an issue with alcohol. It doesn't matter whether Jesus turned water into wine. Will that story help your liver? How will it? Are you understanding what I'm saying? The point is it's bad for your body. And whether Jesus turned it into wine, I, that's not the issue. These are, these are real issues. Are we together? And, and when we try to defend wrong, many times we fail to realize that we're in bondage to what is wrong or under the disguise or the guise of free will. Are we together? Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know anything in case anybody's thinking that. I saw nothing. The heavens did not open. True freedom is self-denial. Every great person had to deny themselves before they could achieve any great thing. That is the foundation of our Christian walk. It says, he who comes to me must first deny himself. You see that? Because so, the way of living as a Christian is self-denial. Must first deny himself. So it means that if you're following Jesus without having first denied yourself, you're having a very unfruitful walk. In fact, you're just trailing him. It first requires self-denial. Tell your neighbor and tell them, deny yourself. <laughs> and this is a big challenge. Can I go a bit deeper? Because one of the biggest challenges is in, the, in the church that we are in and the times that we are in is people are looking for good things. Are we together? So, so the church has become, by, from pressure, pressure from the world, pressure, pressure. Churches have become miracle centers. I'm for miracles. I believe in them. But the church was meant to be a community. It was meant to be a community. Because of pressure. And, and I've realized this pressure comes from one fundamental error in Christians today. Because Christians are more concerned with the act of God as opposed to the ways of God. Moses said, the Bible says that Moses, that God showed his acts to the children of Israel and his ways to Moses. What does that mean? It means this fundamental truth. Well, listen to this. Believers should be more concerned with doing good than living good. You won't like that one. Believers should be more concerned with what? Eh? With doing good than doing what? I'm not saying that God does not want us to live good. But if we look at abundant life, and measure the life of Christ, the life of the apostles, it wouldn't look good in today's standards. But it was an abundant life. Because they were not bound by the, the, the expectations of men. You understand what I'm saying? Because the expectations of men today are, oh, he's not serious. He needs to live behind this. You need to drive this car. You need to live in this lifestyle. You need to achieve. And many times our destinies have been hindered because of expectations of men. Because the only expectations we have are of living good and not doing good. I'm not saying that God is not concerned with us living good. He is. But I want to say this, that God is more concerned with us doing good than just living good. We've got to come back to doing good. The book of Acts says that when the spirit descended on the church, the signs of the, of the revival were not miracles or, or, or financial breakthroughs. It was lives being saved. But if you listen to the way we talk today, we, we measure anointing 
by financial breakthrough. In that church, that person came and then a contract, bam, you will die. I told you today, now we are 20 next week, it's okay. Jesus is with me. Because believers must be more concerned with what? Doing good than living good. What stops us from ministering and living a life of an urban missionary is comfort. Everybody is hindered by comfort because we are alive to this world. If God said today, the hand of the Lord is upon you, you know, and I came to Brother Caleb, Brother Caleb, come, and Brother Chimpukesa, come, 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 my, my, my missionaries. And I feel the spirit is on me. Shandala Bokoya. I saw a vision last night. And God is sending you to Paris. Did you hear that? Amen. He will be like, Father, I receive. I take it. I fast forward it. Lord, just like Mary did with Jesus. Even though it's not my time, it's my time. Are we together? But if I say, Brother Chimpukesa, I also saw a vision. And, and in the vision, I saw the Lord establishing you in a place that starts with Sha, Sha, he'll be thinking Shanghai. Then I'll say, Shangombo. And it's not God. <laughs> no, but you laugh. That's what we'd all say. Satan, get behind me. Because what keeps us from being used by God is comfort. The very same thing that God wants to bless you with, the blessing becomes a hindrance. And many times, the things that God blesses us with, in time, if our hearts are not checked, become the hindrance. You pray for a family. I'm preaching. You pray for a job. You pray for something and the blessing that God bestows on you becomes a hindrance. And that's why you see there were many great people of God that God had to test by seeing whether they'll be willing to give up their children. Oh, man. If God came today and said, give up your son, we would have an overnight for that. That devil, those witches in Wapula, speak, <laughs> witches from Malawi, taking my son. I don't understand what I'm saying. Why? Because our biggest fear is comfort. Because when I said Paris, you didn't think of missionary. You thought of comfort. It's like saying I'm a missionary in Hawaii. What mission? <laughs> Hawaii. There's a great man we used to love. Man, he was in Cape Town and he used to write ah, pastor so-and-so, missionary in Cape Town. Like a missionary in Cape Town. Please. Because our concerns are more with comfort as opposed to our position in God. Sit down. I I'm not saying that God doesn't want to bless you. But I want you to realize that our focus, Paul was willing to move wherever he needed to go because he was more concerned with doing good than living good. As a church, we must be willing to serve the community, okay? And the only way we can serve is by doing good, not just living good. If we take the Bible as Bible, man is not a sign of God, beloved. Let's, let's be serious. We thank God for it, but it's not a sign because the enemy was willing to give Jesus all the kingdoms. He was willing. Not every financial breakthrough. <laughs> Some breakthroughs will break you down. 
but may you not be one of those in Jesus' name. This is, and as a church, the reason what stops us from effectively ministering is comfort. Are you ready to be used by God wherever he needs to use you? Beloved, please let me, let, let me say this categorically. God will never, will never come for what's yours. You understand what I'm saying? He's not interested in that. He's interested in your heart. So God will never just come for your stuff. And, and, and Paul is willing to go to communities and places of people. Let's, let's put that scripture back on. I, I, want, you to, I want you to see the, the type of people that Paul was willing to serve. Are we together? Are we together? Tell your neighbor and say, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. Stay awake. I don't have cover. You know, whew. This time of the year is the year where people just black out in church. You just black out. So I know some people, they try. They're like, today I won't. I won't. Then just, <laughs> open heaven. <laughs> Watch this. Look at the people that Paul would move himself to. He says, religious people, non-religious people, meticulous people, moralists. I like this one. Loose living. Immoralist. That loose living is a very well, nice word. The defeated, the demoralized, whoever. He just says whoever. Because I've realized that God will send you to serve people who you may not necessarily agree with. You, you see, the church has taken, we, we, we've got to shift service and being used by God only in places which we deem as acceptable. Listen, the only answer to darkness is what? Light. The only answer to darkness is light. And the absence of light continues or perpetuates darkness. So the only way for things to change is for light to enter that situation. I may not agree with everyone I serve, but I must agree to serve everyone. I may not agree with my boss, but I must agree to serve them. Can, can I come a bit further? Can I, can, can I close into your inbox? I may not agree with my spouse, but I must agree to serve them. Because, because marriage is a life of service. Submitting yourselves one to another. So, so in life, you will not agree with everyone. Obviously, these were not people that Paul would have fellowship with. You understand what I'm saying? Because I feel that one of the challenges of the church today is that we feel the holier we become, the more isolated we must be. Oh, I'm preaching. But I like the fact that Paul, in spite of this, says this. He says, these were people I didn't agree with. But just because I hung out with them or I served them, watch this, doesn't mean that I became them. Because he says, I did not pick up their lifestyles. Because every life has a lifestyle. Are we together? Every life has a what? And, and the problem with us today, the generation we are in, is we want, the life, we want the life without the lifestyle. So you think that just putting Instagram pictures of a Rolls Royce will get you a Rolls Royce. Your head. You think just putting a big house, I, I can imagine, I can envision. Sit down, sit down. Wealth has a lifestyle. To become a, a, a billionaire has a lifestyle. It doesn't just have a life. So don't, do, don't just look at the highlights. Understand what's going on behind the scenes. So Paul realizes that encountering people is just their life. But I don't necessarily have to pick up their lifestyle. Can I go a bit further? People want the blessings of the church and the blessings of the kingdom without the lifestyle of a Christian. We want the money.
married, but you don't want to be faithful. You want to, you know, you know, you know, people are playing with God. People are playing. And when I say playing with God, I'm not meaning that God is being judgmental or God is getting ready to strike people down. But I think that people have a very confused idea of God. You know what I mean? Like they just have this ability to turn God on. Like, okay, I feel Christian. Pa! Team Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Because, because the way of Christianity is the lifestyle. It's the lifestyle. And we have to pick up the lifestyle of Christians. You don't pick your life, but guess what? You pick your lifestyle. So Paul says this. He says the only way to, 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 to show the difference to the people is to be in a community and display a different lifestyle to them. That's why Jesus said this. He said, the way that they will know you are my disciples is in hell. The way you do what? Are you Christian? The way you do what? Okay, the longer you take, the longer I'll go on. I mean, I've got time. i got time. That's what preachers, we can do 15 hours. In fact, just around 13, I sense the Holy Spirit. The way you love one another, shall they know. So the only way as Christians... To represent a difference is to show a contrary lifestyle in places of darkness. That's the only way. It's the only way. Christianity is not a call to isolation. Listen to me. But it's a call to involvement. Because Christians like holy huddles. I'm with you. Prayer meetings are extremely... In this church, we pray. We pray. We believe in prayer. Are we together? We pray. We have prayer meetings. We pray. In fact, this year, we fasted for 60 days. If that doesn't say we pray, I don't know what does. But I feel like I've fasted for the two years. I've got next year covered as well. Just give me the theme. But, but I've come to realize this. Is that prayer should be for revelation. That when we pray, God should give us instructions on what to do. On what to do. And change begins when we get involved. When we get involved. Christianity is not a call to isolation, but to involvement. To be a part of the community. To understand the needs of society and to see how best we can serve them. And Paul puts it this way. The scripture, put it back, put it back on that first scripture. I need to wind this up. He says this. He says, even though I'm free from the expectations of men and for everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Go to the next, next section. Next section. I didn't take on their lot. I kept my bearings, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I, I believe that one of the challenges that you and I must understand today is that for some reason being bold as a Christian has just been taken as getting them someone that's wrong. That's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. In church we don't dress like that. Why? It's wrong. But why? It's just wrong. How? Oh, it's wrong. I remember one time we were having this debate. Do you listen to secular music? No, secular music, you know, your ears, your heart, the spirits behind the microphone. The spirit of the music. I said, ah, amen. And some boy just said, ah, but do you watch secular movies? I said, shut up. <laughs> shut up right there. We must take time to understand even that which we do not understand. Because whatever you do not understand, you cannot command. You can never influence what you do not understand. You understand? This young man behind the camera here 
is able to use this camera because he understands it. He cannot effectively use this camera without understanding it. So whilst we, we, we are in a world and we're not of this world, we must be able to understand the world so that we can influence it. If we don't take time to influence what's going on behind the scenes, to understand it, we'll not be able to influence. Whatever you cannot command, you cannot understand. Many people are easily swayed because of a lack of understanding and a lack of strength. I need to wind this up. I need to wind this up. But I believe that one of the fears of people engaging in the community, engaging, because I, the, one of the first things I see about believers is the minute they reach a bit of turbulence in their work environment and in a specific place, then the first option must be, I must leave. God doesn't want me here. Is that not true? This job is giving me grief. Okay, so if there's grief, who do you think is giving you the grief? The enemy, right? So don't you think living is a part of the enemy's plan? I'm preaching. Be be because we don't get it. We don't get it. That where we find frustration, that's your place of elevation. The point of frustration is a place of elevation. That place the enemy wants to frustrate you is a place that God knows he wants to elevate you. Your place of struggle, your place of struggle is your place of upliftment. But many people are afraid. And the reason why many people change. So, so Paul begins to meet a whole bunch of different people who've taken on different life, different ability, different this, different lifestyles. And they all have different things. But the one common purpose is this, is that life will never make sense unless you understand the purpose behind it. Paul says, I, I'm doing this because of the message. They're doing whatever. I don't know why they're doing it. But I'm doing it because of the message. Can I ask you a question? Have you understood the purpose for your marriage? Have you understood the purpose for your job? Have you understood the purpose for your ministry? Be because if you don't understand the purpose, you keep moving from place to place. Thinking it's all about movement. It's all about this. It's all about new job. Oh, maybe I need a new role. May maybe I need a new relationship. May maybe I need a new car. But Paul says, you don't need a new place. You just need to understand the new life in God. It's a new life. Because our mission should not be movement. My mission isn't movement. But my mission, but my movement is part of the mission. We've got to understand this, that our, our mission is not just move, just move, progress, move, live, elevate, live, jump, move. It's the progression of the mission of God. When you understand your purpose, Paul, Paul was not afraid to be any place because he understood his reason. He understood his reason. When you have understood your reason, listen to this, when you have understood your, real, your reason, you realize that the position is not the mission. It's simply a tool. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's a tool to push the kingdom. It's a tool to move the gospel. It's a tool to be used by God. But people have become lost in the tool. We've become lost in the tool. We've got to get back to understanding the mission. And when you realize this, beloved, it means that God can send you to anyone that he needs. So in case I start playing, oh, okay, we'll start playing. God can send you to anyone that he needs. I believe the challenge of the church today is not the power of God. I've, I've heard people say that too many times. We need prayer. I agree. But Jesus already highlighted the problem. It was not prayer. It was laborers. He said, the issue here is not that we're not praying. 
but that laborers are not going into the harvest field. Because he says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send what? Laborers. And what stops us from being used by God is comfort, ego, pride. Representing God in the kingdom. Representing God in the community. Sometimes I feel like we, we also begin to choose the kind of people we feel are worthy of the gospel. Can I tell you a story? So there was this one time, um, me as the pastor, okay? I believe everybody's for the gospel. And I remember preaching to some young kids in our youth group. And we're saying to them, go out there, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. We're like, yeah, preach the gospel. Then one of them were like, pastor, let's go preach to the prostitutes. We're like, whoa, whoa. Whoa. We said, leave them a flyer or something. Leave them. And, and I, at that moment, I began to question myself. And I said, uh-uh. So, do I feel that some people are not worthy of me preaching to them? Why, why am I afraid to preach to a prostitute? I'll tell you why. Because if somebody saw me, the question is, what would they think I was doing? I was ministering the gospel. <laughs> you understand? But, but, but let's be realistic here. There are some people who minister the gospel, even that other gospel. That's enough to be on the streets. But you see, so what stopped me from preaching the gospel was my, what do you call it? My reputation. Isn't that what Peter did when he said, do you know him? He says, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. So we do that. We deny Christ by not preaching. Listen, when we don't preach to others, we're denying Christ. We're denying Christ. And we have not understood the reason for our salvation. So this one girl decides to go and preach the gospel. She goes and preaches the gospel to one of the ladies, the same ladies. So what she does is she's like, She's driving for an overnight, and then she stops on the corner, and she stops, and she feels compulsion by the Holy Spirit to say, Jesus loves you. So she rolls the window down and just says, Jesus loves you! Square! Dig out. Then she felt compelled to go back. She met the lady, she ministered to the lady, and they led the lady to the Lord. Then on Sunday after the youth group, the girls are like, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. We led a lady on the streets. We, we used to call them uh, uh, security guards. Because it was in a polite way to say, neighborhood watch. Some of them, neighborhood watch. We led them to the Lord. I was like, wow. And pastor, they are here. I said, eh? Pray for them. Eh? I was like, no, there are some specialists uh, men for this. Deliverances. Some people are specialized. Not me. So I wanted to call Pastor someone. He wasn't there. I was like, ah, Lord. Because you know what? Because I was like, I was thinking in my mind, so if I pray for her, maybe what's in her? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. See, you see all you guys, you guys are, you're, you're fake. You're all fake. Because that's how you think, right? That's how we think. Pray for this person who's got a, a critical disease. What if? Because because we, we choose, we think that there's people who are worthy of the gospel. So we prayed for her. She slayed by the spirit. Made noise. Hey, I was like, shh, shh, shh. Suddenly, this lady gave up her ways, like for real, by the power of the Holy Ghost. Long story short, last year she got married in Mount Zion. All because of one girl. Come on, man. All because of one girl who was brave enough to minister to her. Beloved, never judge somebody's reason.
because of a season. Oh, man, man. Don't judge somebody by the season of their life to say that's their purpose. Because God has this way of turning prostitutes like Rahab and putting them in the lineage of Jesus Christ. We should never write somebody off. I don't know who I'm preaching to this place. You still have a purpose over your life. You still have an assignment over your life. You could have fallen several times. But God is saying he's going to send people like Paul to remind you of who you are. God has not judged your reason by your season. God has not judged your calling by where you are right now. God has seen where you are supposed to be. And he's going to send people into your life. He's going to send people to help you. He's going to send people to deliver you. Mount Zion, I wish there were some people in this house who are ready to say I'm ready to preach the gospel to whoever needs the gospel I'm not going to be selective I'm not going to be prejudiced I'm not going to pick and choose because I am just simply a vessel that God is using I wish there were some believers in this house who are ready to say at work I will preach the gospel in my family I will preach the gospel in my community I will preach the gospel why? because I am what I am by the grace of God I've been saved Saved so that I can serve my community. I've been called so that I can call other people. I've been picked so that I can pick others. I've been delivered so I can deliver others. Ah, Shantala Bokoso. I may not have everything that other people have. Some people trust in horses. Some people trust in chariots. Some people trust in their finances. Some people trust in their jobs. Some people trust in their businesses. But I trust in my God. And wherever he says I must go, I will go. Whatever he says I must do, I will do. Wherever he sends me, I am available. Mount Zion. A change in season is never a change of purpose or reason. Let's stop judging people by the season of life that they are in. Don't judge somebody who enters the church by the skirt that they wear. Don't measure the length of their skirt. Measure the greatness of their purpose. Man, I'm preaching. Church needs to stop becoming fashion police. Eh? Unfortunately, God sees the fashion says of our hearts. You could be dressed well, but you can never cover up sin. Oh yeah, you can, you can cover up well. Oh man, you can cover up well, but you can never cover up a wrong heart. You can never cover a wrong heart. And we need to start preaching and understand that we've been saved for a reason. And everything that we should seek here should be for the reason of the kingdom, for the reason of the gospel. Paul was willing to serve people who were unworthy. People by virtue, by virtue, by virtue of association with them. I could imagine controversy. Paul was seen with prostitutes. I mean, if I saw apostle so-and-so today with a prostitute, We'll just judge. You understand? I mean, church is so difficult like this. Is that if you are a man, if they just see you with a woman, just a woman, not even a, just a woman, people already did you. So say, eh, eh. But church needs to understand its reason. We are saved for a reason. That reason is to preach the gospel. I don't care what you say. The primary reason is the gospel. Everything else is secondary. The primary reason is gospel. Listen to me. You could die single and still go to heaven. But you could marry and go to hell. Uh Uh-uh. 
So what is important here? The Bible says the rich man was in hell. I am all for resources. I am all for blessing. But let's put first things first. And look at the, the principle that Paul demonstrates this. Is that this. When you have given yourself as a servant of God, no situation is permanent. He would be here. He would be there. He'll be over there. He'll be over there. Because God will move who he can use. Oh man, come on, you know. God will move who he can use. I said God will move who he can use. So if he can use you, he will move you. <laughs> if you want to be moved, tell God I'm ready to be used. Stand to your feet. There was a bit of a heavy message. We'll be, we'll be back to regular programming next week. But I really felt this in my spirit today. To say, where are the missionaries? Where are the urban missionaries? Where are people who have devoted their lives for the kingdom? Where, where are people who have devoted their lives for the advancement of the kingdom agenda. Let that be our prayer today. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in this place and you're saying, Pastor, I want to give my life to the Lord. My life has been a mess. But today, I'm surrendering, I'm yielding to you. Understand that the purpose of my life is not just self-gratification, but it's the kingdom. And you're saying today, my life has been a mess, but I want to make it right with God. If you're the one I'm talking to, I want you to lift up your hand wherever you are. Lift up your hand. Saying, I want to give my life to Christ. If I died, if I died today, I don't know where I'll be. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray together. Everyone, let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. I believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died for all my sins, past, present, and future. From today, I make a decision to live for him. From today, I ask, Holy Spirit, live in me. Renew me, refresh me, and restore me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, celebrate the Lord, somebody. You know, I believe, I believe that one of the greatest blessings of the times that we have is development. And with development comes, life becomes more comfortable. But let's never let comfort hinder us from being used by God. You know, for the longest time, um, I was afraid, not afraid, but I never, I never, I never spoke of my, my pastoral side per se at church. Never once have I gone, sorry, in the office. And I've realized that people have begun to know me now more for my faith than my profession. 
I remember going to meet one of my one of my business relations, and from nowhere he was like, Pastor. This is a man that wasn't answering my calls for work. I called him and he answered and said, Pastor. And I just said, Ah, uh-uh, how did you know? And he says, I saw it on Facebook. Listen to me. When you trust God, God will take you further than your own efforts. <laughs> I got a call from my head of marketing at the office. And they have this, 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 um, this segment in our, in our profession, in our, in our institution, where they want to capture the lives of work people. This is done in South Africa. Okay? So I got a call and they say they're doing video segments, YouTube segments. And they want me. So can you imagine that the business will be flying people all the way from South Africa to come and film us here. They'll be coming here in October. They'll be coming to shoot here on, on, I think, the 21st, one on the weekend in October. Because let me tell you this. When you give yourself as a vessel to God, I'm not, I'm not using myself as a highlight, but it's a lesson that God was teaching me that what you should be known for above all is your faith. Is your faith. The principal thing that people should know you of is your faith. Don't hide your faith. Your story is necessary. That's why we have different people in this church. Different kinds. Because we need every single one of you. Your story is important. Your story is necessary. Father, I pray for everybody now under the sound of my voice. Lord, that you equip them to be a testimony. You'll equip them for their story. You'll equip them as a vessel in their workplaces, in their businesses, in their communities. In every aspect of life, God use them mightily. Let them represent you. Where things are out of alignment at work, let them be the light that is needed. In their family, let them be the light that is needed. In the community, let them be the light that is needed. We glorify and we honor you. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer, for delivering your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And every saint in this house said, Amen. Amen. Let's welcome our coordinator.